Inverse hyperbolic Inverse hyperbolic Inverse hyperbolic Inverse hyperbolic function All right, so what we're going to study in this video is inverse hyperbolic functions. All right, so in the previous video, we've introduced hyperbolic functions. So what we may want to do, just as for trig functions, is define inverse hyperbolic functions. So to define the inverse, we need the function to be one-to-one. -one. So if we look at the six hyperbolic functions here, there's actually four of them that are one-to-one. -one. Hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic tan, hyperbolic cotan, and hyperbolic cosecant. The two other ones, namely the hyperbolic secant and hyperbolic cosine, are not one-to-one. -one. So to define the inverse here, we'll need to restrict the domain. So the choice of principal domain here is to take the positive real axis for both of these functions. All right, so with these restricted domains, we can now define the inverse hyperbolic functions for all of them. So here's what we get. So remember that when you define an inverse function, you're exchanging domain and range. So here I've indicated the domain and the range for all six inverse hyperbolic functions. And you could also sketch the graph of these inverse hyperbolic functions. I'm not going to do it, but all you would do is take the graph of the hyperbolic functions and do uh, just reflect them about the y equals to x axis. All right, so now that we've defined inverse hyperbolic functions, we may want to calculate their derivatives. So as an example, let me calculate the derivative of inverse hyperbolic sine of x. So y is equal to inverse hyperbolic sine of x if and only if x is equal to hyperbolic sine of y by definition of inverse functions. Now to calculate the derivative of y or inverse hyperbolic sine of x, what I'll do is use implicit differentiation on this side just as we did for inverse trig functions. So I'll take the derivative with respect to x on both sides of the equation here, remembering that y is itself a function of x. So on the left hand side I get 1, on the right hand side, I have to use the chain rule. So I first get hyperbolic cosine of y times the derivative of y, which is y prime. And y prime is what I'm trying to calculate. So I conclude that y prime is equal to 1 over hyperbolic cosine of y. But that's not the end of the story. Just as for trig functions, what we want to do here is rewrite that in terms of x. So in the case of trig functions, we had two choices here. We could either use uh, the right triangle and then identify the size and use properties of trig functions, or we could use trig identities. Here we only have one choice because we can't use the right triangle because we're talking about hyperbolic functions. They don't have the same properties as trig functions on the right triangle. So what we need to do here is use hyperbolic identities to rewrite the right hand side in terms of x. So more precisely, we know that hyperbolic cosine square of y minus hyperbolic sine square of y is equal to 1. So I can rewrite that as hyperbolic cosine square of y which is equal to 1 plus hyperbolic sine square of y and then I need to take the square root but if you look back at the definition of the hyperbolic cosine you will see that it's always positive. So here I must take the positive square root. All right, and then of course hyperbolic sine of y is just equal to x by definition, so this is equal to square root of 1 plus x squared. So substituting back in my expression for y prime here, I conclude that y prime, or in other words the derivative of the inverse hyperbolic sine of x, is equal to 1 over square root of 1 plus x squared. We can do a very similar calculation for the other inverse hyperbolic functions, and this is what the result is. So if you look at these formula, you'll see that they look very similar to the derivatives for inverse trig functions, but again, they're not the same. The signs are different, so you always have to be careful. And one thing I want to mention here is that once you know these, you also have a, a, a corresponding table for integrals, right? For example, from the first expression here, I could also write that the integral of 1 over square root of 1 plus x squared dx is equal to inverse hyperbolic sine of x plus my constant of integration and similarly for all other five uh, inverse hyperbolic functions. Now one question you may ask is the following. 
So if hyperbolic functions are defined in terms of exponentials, is it possible to rewrite inverse hyperbolic functions in terms of logarithms? That seems plausible, right? Because logarithms are inverse functions to exponentials, so inverse hyperbolic functions should somehow have an expression in terms of logarithms. Well, let's see how it goes. So let me try to find such an expression for the inverse hyperbolic sine function. So if y is equal to inverse hyperbolic sine of x, then x is equal to hyperbolic sine of y. Okay, so I want to find an expression in terms of logs, so I may want here to rewrite this in terms of exponentials. So hyperbolic sine of y is e to the y minus e to the minus y over 2. Right, so just rewriting this expression here, I get that 2x minus e to the y plus e to the minus y is equal to 0. All right, now let me multiply this expression by e to the y. What will I get? I'll get e to the, or minus e to the 2y plus 2x times e to the y plus 1, which is equal to 0. Okay, now what is this? Now you probably would not recognize it at first, but this is in fact a quadratic equation. What do I mean by that? So let me just define, say, z is equal to e to the y. Then I can rewrite this as minus z squared plus 2x times z plus 1 is equal to 0, which is just a quadratic equation in z, right? Okay, cool. So I can write down now the solutions. So z, you remember the quadratic formula. So I get minus b over 2a, so that's minus 2x over minus 2, plus or minus 1 over 2a, so that's 1 over minus 2, square root b squared, so that's 4x squared minus 4ac, so that gives me plus 4. All right, so I can simplify this a little bit. I'll get x plus or minus and then I can take the 4 out, which becomes a 2 when I take the square root. So I get plus or minus, so minus 1, square root of x squared plus 1. Okay, so I can now plug that back in here to get an equation for e to the y, because z here is e to the y, right? So this should be my expression for e to the y. So I'll get e to the y, which is equal to x. Now here I can choose the sign, in fact. So I have two solutions for the quadratic equation, but because z is equal to e to the y, we know that z is positive. Exponentials are always positive. So I must choose the positive solution here. So in other words, I need to have x plus square root of x squared plus 1, because if I have minus, that becomes negative. So the only solution of this quadratic equation here is x plus square root of 1 plus x squared, and that's because it's a quadratic equation for the exponential, which is always positive. All right, that's cool. And then finally, I can uh, take the logarithm, the natural logarithm on both sides of this equation. What I'll get to that is that y is equal to the natural logarithm of x plus square root of 1 plus x squared. But remember what y is. This is the inverse hyperbolic sine of x. So what I found here is an expression for the inverse hyperbolic sine of x in terms of logarithm. Awesome. So you can do very similar calculations for the other five inverse hyperbolic functions, and it turns out that they all have nice expressions in terms of logarithms. So here they are. In this table, I've also indicated the domain of each of these functions in terms of x. All right, so let me end this video with a question. Why is it that these crazy-looking hyperbolic functions that are defined in terms of exponentials are so similar to trig functions? Well, we've already seen one connection between trig functions and hyperbolic functions, which is that trig functions parameterize circles, while hyperbolic functions parameterize hyperbolas. But why is it that they satisfy very similar looking identities, they have similar derivatives, and so on and so forth? Well, stay tuned, this is something we'll see in class, and in fact the answer might surprise you. You'll see.